For some 1,500 years, the worship of the true God centered around a tabernacle or temple in ancient Israel where priests offered animal sacrifices. Although some people today dismiss all of that as the product of primitive human ignorance, the Bible reveals it as part of God's plan. I believe we can't fully appreciate why Christ Jesus died on the cross unless we know why God had Moses build the tabernacle. And that's why the Bible says so much about the tabernacle and the later temple from Exodus through Revelation. That portable tabernacle and its successor, the stone temple in Jerusalem, are helpful in understanding God's plan of salvation through Christ. Let's look at how the Bible ties all of this together. Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of turning to your word to receive instruction from you. We thank you, Lord, for providing the Bible to everyone on earth in thousands of languages so that people can grasp the real reason why we're here on this planet, why we live, why we die, and what hope there is for the future. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with all these things through your word. And we thank you for the opportunity this morning to lift our voices in songs of praise to you. We pray your blessing on this service and on all who join us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together now in singing Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture burst on my sight angels descending ring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my song raising my savior all the day long this is my story song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long.
Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, and he gave them a prayer that set the example for us in our personal prayers. It's called the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer. Let's join our hearts together now as we speak those words together in prayer to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our mission with these live stream services is twofold. First, to provide traditional worship services to believers who would not otherwise have them, those who are confined to the home or those who don't have a church nearby that preaches the word. And then secondly, to reach out to the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. We've been paying Facebook and Google YouTube to boost our messages to reach a wide audience. And over the past couple of months, they've been reaching a half a million people each month with our video thumbnails. And thousands of those people click on the thumbnails to watch and hear the message. But some of our messages are now spreading virally on their own. For example, Facebook and YouTube report over 8,000 views for our recent message comparing King Saul's pursuit of David to stop him from becoming king to events in our country today. More than 8,000 views for the message on how the Satan the devil came to exist and 16,500 views so far for our message on Moses' Ark of the Covenant not being a radio. That's equivalent to preaching these messages to a stadium full of people. You can share in continuing this gospel outreach by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page. <clears throat> Today's scripture reading is found in the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning with the first verse. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room with a lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread, this was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. 
Now let's join together in singing, He Leadeth Me. For some 1,500 years, the worship of the true God centered around a tabernacle or temple in ancient Israel where priests offered animal sacrifices. Although some people today dismiss all of that as a product of primitive human ignorance, the Bible reveals it as part of God's plan. I believe we can't fully appreciate why Christ Jesus died on the cross unless we know why God had Moses build that tabernacle. And that's why the Bible says so much about the tabernacle and the later temple from Exodus through Revelation. That portable tabernacle and its successor, the stone temple in Jerusalem, are helpful in understanding God's plan of salvation through Christ. Let's look at how the Bible ties all of this together for us. The tabernacle was a key part of the covenant or agreement that God entered into with the nation of Israel. He gave them through Moses a collection of over 600 laws governing their daily lives 
and their worship. In exchange for keeping and obeying those laws, the covenant or agreement specified that God would bless that nation in the land that he led them to after freeing them from slavery in Egypt. The law of Moses governed that nation of Israel for some 1,500 years, but it would not be permanent. Around 600 years before Christ, God told the prophet Jeremiah that he would replace that old covenant with a new covenant. In the 31st chapter of Jeremiah's scroll, we read, Look, the days are coming, that is the Lord's declaration, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That new covenant was instituted by Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples. We read at 1 Corinthians, After supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The red wine in that cup represented Christ's blood that was poured out the next day when he went to the cross. The old covenant mediated by Moses was replaced by the new covenant mediated by Christ. But we can't fully grasp and appreciate the new covenant without knowing something about the old covenant and its tabernacle of worship. We find help to draw the connection in the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, especially its ninth and 10th chapters. That ninth chapter begins by saying, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary, a tabernacle that was set up. The tabernacle was a multi-layered tent that served as a portable temple of worship while the Israelites moved from one encampment to another on their way to the Promised Land. But it was much more than that. The tabernacle was also a copy of heavenly things. The Apostle John, in describing his vision in Revelation, says, I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So he speaks about a tabernacle in heaven. The eighth chapter of Hebrews called Moses' tabernacle a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. And the ninth chapter says, Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. How did the Israelites happen to possess a copy of heavenly things? The eighth chapter explained, Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. When God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai, he not only gave him the Ten Commandments, but he also showed him the plan of the tabernacle, exactly how it should be made. The instructions begin in the 25th chapter of Exodus where God told Moses, Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And God's instructions go on for several chapters following that. A courtyard 150 feet long and 75 feet wide surrounded the tabernacle. And we see in this replica constructed at Timna Park in Israel, the courtyard was formed by curtains hanging from poles. Within that courtyard, near one end, was the altar of burnt offerings where animal sacrifices were burned. The tent or tabernacle stood within the courtyard near the other end. And it was that tabernacle that was a shadow or a copy of heavenly things. As you can see in this cutaway illustration, it had two rooms. 
one to the right here and then one to the left, but we see the curtain cut away so that we can see what's going on inside. Well, parting the curtain at the entrance to the right, you would enter first into a large rectangular room called the Holy Place. And at the opposite end of that room was another curtain blocking from sight a smaller square room called the Most Holy that we see on the left in this slide. Hebrews chapter 9 describes it like this. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Aside from the description of the lampstand found in the book of Exodus, we know what it looked like. <clears throat> because some 1500 years after it was built, the armies of the Roman Empire sacked the city of Jerusalem and took the contents of the temple as spoils of war. Romans celebrated that victory over the Jews by constructing a huge arch in Rome, the Arch of Titus. And within that arch was detailed uh, carvings or reliefs showing what happened in Titus's victory over the Jews. And in that arch, you can clearly see the lampstand as it's being carried away by soldiers of the Roman legions. Here we see a reproduction of the holy compartment of the temple, the first compartment with the high priest and an assistant. This full-scale reproduction is displayed in Timna Park in modern Israel. The description of the tabernacle in the letter to the Hebrews goes on to say, Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Just as the courtyard was formed by a wall of curtains and the tabernacle itself was a multi-layered tent, the inner room, the most holy, was also walled off from that first room by a curtain. And inside that most holy compartment was the Ark of the Covenant. Here we see an artist's rendition of the high priest in the holy compartment with the curtain to the most holy pulled back. Here the Ark is barely visible due to God's glory shining above it. This reproduction of the Ark of the Covenant used in the Harrison Ford movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, shows the Ark in more detail. Hebrews described the Ark and its contents, which Moses put into it after it was built. And those contents shown here in a reproduction were the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. The letter to the Hebrews goes on to explain that the Jewish priests ministered daily in that first holy compartment, but it was only the high priest who was allowed to enter the most holy, and even that was just once a year on the Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Hebrews says, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The blood from a sacrificed animal was taken into the Most Holy by the high priest to atone for the sins of the people. God gave those instructions in the 16th chapter of Leviticus where we read that the high priest had to offer a bull as a sacrifice for his own sins first and for those of the rest of the temple workers. And then he had to offer a goat as a sacrifice for the sins of the Jewish people. And he had to take the blood of those sacrifices into the most holy compartment of the temple. Leviticus chapter 16 in the Jewish Publication Society's 1917 version says, 
And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the ark cover on the east. And before the ark cover shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with his blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the ark cover and before the ark cover. So that is the annual Yom Kippur ceremony, also described in later in the New Testament in the letter to Hebrews. And this New Testament book explains that those temple ceremonies carried on by the Jewish high priest for 1,500 years were still just temporary and were given by God to illustrate what Christ Jesus would do when shedding his own blood on the cross for our sins. Hebrews begins that explanation by saying, the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. And then Hebrews goes on to explain, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through a greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, not a part of this creation. Yes, the sacrifices at that ancient tabernacle serve the purpose of helping us appreciate what Christ did to atone for our sins. Hebrews goes on to say, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Yes, the most holy room of the Jewish tabernacle was a shadow or a copy of the real most holy place in heaven. And the actions of the Jewish high priest once each year on Yom Kippur in taking the blood of goats and bulls into the tabernacle's most holy compartment, that pictured and pointed forward to what Jesus would do when he entered the real most holy in heaven after shedding his own blood on the cross. Letter to the Hebrews continues, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer were sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Yes, the blood of the goats and bulls and the ashes of those sacrificed animals pointed forward to the real cleansing from sin accomplished by the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Hebrews then says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. And again, it is that new covenant that Jesus instituted at the Last Supper with his disciples. We read in... Uh, First, in 1 uh, Corinthians, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And Hebrews explains, When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. 
That's what Moses did when instituting the old law covenant with its tabernacle for worship. It served God's purpose for some 1,500 years, but it was only temporary. It was a visible, tangible thing, a tent of worship made by human hands to illustrate the invisible things in heaven and how Christ would accomplish our salvation when he returned to heaven after his sacrificial death on the cross. Hebrews next says, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but, with the, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Christ pouring out his own blood at the cross and sacrifice for our sins was the real thing. The Jewish high priest acted it out from year to year on the annual Yom Kippur Day of Atonement, but Christ did the real thing and had to do it only once, once for all time. Hebrews continues, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yes, Christ's work atoning for our sins was finished at the cross. He had to do it just once to permanently take away our sins. But Christ himself isn't finished because he has other work to do. This chapter of Hebrews concludes by saying, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of the many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Yes, Christ will appear a second time. We are waiting for his second coming. He's coming again to save us from this wicked world, this wicked world that hated him and that hates us today. He's coming again to take us home to heaven. When Jesus died on the cross, he opened the way for us to enter the most holy place of heaven itself. The Gospel of Mark tells us, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Yes, that curtain that blocked off entrance to the most holy was torn in two from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross. It was torn open so that we can follow him into the most holy. The next chapter of Hebrews tells us, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain. We have confidence because our sins have been forgiven our sins that shamed us away from God's presence. Our sins are gone, so Christ takes us through the torn open curtain of the tabernacle into the very presence of Almighty God. The tabernacle's message for us is this blessed assurance of eternity in God's presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with the illustration that you've provided through the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. We thank you, Lord, for having this acted out for 1,500 years, year after year, so that we can greatly appreciate what you did for us in the sacrifice of your Son at the cross, that Christ's blood opened the way for us to enter heaven itself, that most holy place where you dwell. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful blessing, and we thank you for the assurance that when we put faith in Christ, the way is open for us to go through that torn open curtain into your very presence to be with you forever and ever and ever. 
And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together now in singing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to take our minds off the things of this world for a while, to focus on you and on your word. And we thank you, Lord, that the things in your word strengthen us to face the things in this world, to face them with courage and with hope and with assurance of the promise that you give us, a promise to be with us now and to bring us to be with you forever. And we give you thanks and praise for these blessings and pray that you'll inspire us to share them with others as we have opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you. With this sheep securely fold you, God be with you till we meet again, till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we meet, till we meet.